there are a lot of narratives in the college football world right now. Now, narratives have a negative connotation to them just by the nature of that word, but I think there's a lot of narratives right now in the college football landscape that we need to be careful of. A lot of, lot of, uh, lot of tomfoolery going on right now in the college football world. So some narratives that I think we need to be cautious of together as a college football community. Let's dive into a couple of those right now. The first narrative that is floating around out there and has a lot of traction is that Florida is just dead in the water. A lot of folks saying Billy Napier is going to be fired before the season is even over. A lot of people saying that Florida is just no good to begin with. Knock it down to the studs, blow it all up. Florida's dead in the water. And while, while I see where you're coming from, because Florida, let's, let's be real here, they underperformed based on their own expectations in Gainesville last year. Florida, I believe, has a lot more under the hood than most people would like to believe. And I think also context for Florida is massive. I'll reset the table for you one more time. Florida, first year for Billy Napier. They go six and seven. Say, okay, eh, good, not great. It's year one. Let's see where they go in year two. Year two, that over-under win total comes out in Vegas. Five and a half was the number. So we're saying, okay, expectations aren't sky high for the Gators, but it is what it is. So we sat here on this show this time last year and said, for Florida, I would need to see progress to count year two as a success. Okay, so the number I was looking for was seven wins. Now, Florida, just so we're on the same page here, two plays away from seven wins. If you stop that fourth and a mile against Missouri, that's a win. You kick the field goal against Arkansas, that's a win. I understand. Woulda, shoulda, coulda. It is what it is. You can't go back and change the past. So they went five and seven. But again, I think when you look at what they are in year three, you have a second-year quarterback in the system in Graham Mertz, who's going on his 19th year playing college football. Crazy but true. They have tightened the screws on that wide receiver room. Went and got one of his go-to guys from Wisconsin. You got Eugene Wilson coming into his own, I believe, in this offense. His true sophomore year in Gainesville. Secondary is a lot better than it was a year ago. They were banged up there last year. Had to play a lot of young bucks. They feel much better about that unit. They feel better about the defense overall. You gave Austin Armstrong, who was a young defensive coordinator, a little bit more of support with Ron Roberts joining into that staff over there as well. The bottom line here is Florida is not nearly as far gone as some folks would lead you to believe. I'm not telling you they're winning the SEC. I'm not telling you they're going to win double-digit ballgames. But to assume that Florida is just going to be an easy dub whenever you stroll into the swamp, my friend, we are, uh, we are not necessarily on the same page or we're not aligned in our train of thought. The big thing for Florida, the thing that I'm watching most closely here, do they have a year three culture internally? Do they act like a year three team when it comes to procedures, when it comes to execution, when it comes to being able to consistently be the same team week in and week out, regardless of big win, close loss, whatever it is, do they continue to answer the call to action? Okay, that's going to be the difference maker for me with Florida in year 300 billion Napier. So not dead in the water. That uh, that narrative, I believe, is a little bit dangerous, a little bit sketchy to, uh, to buy into. Another narrative here that we got to make sure we have our head on a swivel with, something you're going to hear a lot this offseason season. Alabama is going to fall off in 2024. Now, this narrative is probably something that you'll hear from other folks in the SEC, and that's fine. I mean, more power to you. I would speak negatively against my rival as well, or the team that pretty much run the conference for the better part of the last 17 years. It is what it is. New head coach in Kalen DeBoer. There is no way to overestimate the impact Nick Saban had on Alabama. He made Alabama, Alabama, what they were for the last nearly two decades. But there's a lot of folks that have reservations about Kalen DeBoer and long-term his success at Alabama. And I think we're going to you know, get to see what he is long-term, hopefully. But when you talk about Alabama and, and the reasons why you don't think Kalen DeBoer will succeed long-term, it usually is tied to something with him as a recruiter. Say, I can't recruit in the SEC. This is a different pace for him, like a a lot of things that probably lined up with that train of thought. Say what you want about Kalen DeBoer as a recruiter. Dude, he coached some football now, all right? 104 and 12 as a head coach, and in year one, you're not going to learn about Kalen DeBoer as a recruiter because Kalen DeBoer is, for the most part, utilizing the ingredients that Nick Saban left for him, okay? And that's not to speak ill of Kalen DeBoer. It's just saying the cupboard is pretty stocked. Now the transfer portal does what the transfer portal does, and You know, they have about 33% of that production on defense turning from last year. But everybody that's on this roster that 
committed out of high school to Alabama, was a part of a top three class. Now, unproven production means a lot of different things in different places. What it means to Alabama is you're probably a four or five star that just hasn't really seen the field yet. Okay, so say what you want about Alabama. Say what you want about Kalen DeBoer long term. I'm not expecting a major fall off in 2024. Now, are they going to win the SEC? You know, we're going to find out, but I think they'll have the talent roster and they'll have the staff in place to be in every single ball game they play. That's how I feel about it. Will that happen? Remains to be seen, but I would, uh, I'd be slow to assume Alabama is going to have some sort of massive fall off. Another narrative you're going to hear here. Uh, Peyton Thorne can't get it done. Peyton Thorne had a underwhelming first year in Auburn. There's no way around that. But the context with him, I think, is everything. It's everything. Like, say what you want about how he underperformed. The dude did not have the weapons he needed to be successful. He missed all of the most important practice period during a college football calendar year, which is, of course, spring practice. So he was kind of trying to get acclimated on the fly. And, oh, by the way, I think the system last year, by nature of the lack of result they had, probably wasn't, wasn't as favorable as you would need if you're Peyton Thorne. So I say all that to say Hugh Freeze now more or less running the offense. You got a freak show wide receiver in Cam Coleman who's going to be out there for you as a true freshman. We saw what he could do in the A day. And I think when you talk about Peyton Thorne, there's one thought exercise I would encourage us to have together. How do you view Peyton Thorne if fourth and 31 against Alabama is incomplete? I think he, you, you view him very differently than you do right now because instead of Peyton Thorne being the guy who you know, didn't have all the success you wanted him to have his first year and then changing that label to Peyton Thorne, the quarterback who took down Alabama, Nick Saban's last year in Tuscaloosa, he wasn't on the field for that. He wasn't playing safety back there when Jalen Milrow launched that missile to Isaiah Bond. Like, it is what it is. So all I'm trying to say here is the thought that Peyton Thorne is the, is the governor for Auburn's success in 2024. He'll be a massive part of it either way, but this idea that he just doesn't have the juice to get it done, I'd be slow to assume that. He did have a pretty good career at Michigan State, just so we're on the same page. We've seen him play a high level of football. Let's go to the Big Ten for our last narrative we got to guard against here together as a college football community. A lot of folks saying Ryan Day is no good, right? A lot of people saying Ryan Day is what's holding Ohio State back, and they're very quick to point to the Michigan games and the way that they were pretty much bullied two of the last three years. The thing with me with Ryan Day is at every single turn, at every single down data point for Ohio State, he has been willing and quick to evolve. We talk about the game against Oregon where Oregon came into the shoe, ran for pretty much, I don't even know how many hundred yards it was. Ryan Day very quickly says, we got to be better defensively. That offseason goes and hires Jim Knowles. Now this last season, Ohio State was a defensive-led football team. Had the ball with a chance to go and beat Michigan on that final drive. They don't get it done. In large part, you look at the quarterback play last year, not being good enough to elevate Ohio State and maximize the skill they had. Ryan Day doesn't say, okay, let's go back another year, let's have another offseason and try and you know, will ourselves over that hump. He says, we got to get better at quarterback. Go to the portal, land Will Howard. I think they're going to be better offensively this year. So when I look at Ryan Day and Ohio State, the reason why I don't buy the whole, well, he's, he's not going to be able to get it done. One is just like we've seen that's not true. If that field goal goes in against Georgia in the college football playoff game a couple of years ago, he's got a national title to his name. So, again, woulda, shoulda, coulda, but I think that's a point in itself to be had there. The other thing is, like, Ohio State's won a lot of ball games under Ryan Day. Like, Ryan Day, I think, has got an 87% win percentage in Columbus. Y'all, that's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. So, when we talk about Ryan Day and being born on third base and all those jokes, like, I don't understand how you can be born on third base and have the roster that Ohio State has. Like, has the brand helped Ryan Day recruit the guys that he's got on campus right now? Of course. But you still have to put them in position to be successful. Ryan Day had a team that went 11-1 last year. And then he's pushed the envelope in every single since this offseason to get better and get over the hump, beat Michigan, win the Big Ten, win a national title. So I would actually argue that Ryan Day is – a large part of the success that Ohio State's had since he's been there. The brand helps. There's no way around it. But his willingness to evolve, I think, is half the battle. And being willing to evolve and continuing to evolve means they're going to keep improving 
And if you improve from 11 and 1, I think we can all kind of do the math on where that thing's headed. So a lot of narratives out there, a lot of things to be on guard against. But even so, we'll do it together. We'll link arms. We'll stick through these college football lies and the trenches that they bring against us together. And uh, we'll swap those down one by one. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel here to make sure you don't miss an episode of The Hard Count. Also, be sure to check out other videos on the On3 YouTube channel.